unfortunately in-car footage is not going to be the same as it used to be with this obnoxious fuel pump i may try to see if i can insulate it to the chassis and kind of help the noise in the car a little bit but until then i'll just turn the volume down a little bit on these scenes try to get a little more data everything looked fine on the first test drive um, I blew a fuse last night when I just had it idling in the garage and it's the fuse that supplies power to my um, my fuse box in here not the one I made but the original one that I'm utilizing for lots of different things uh, including powering the mega squirt so when that fuse blew everything shut down it also supplies power to both these gauges my dash display um, and a number of other things the knock module the uh, boost control solenoid um, All those things are getting power from the circuit that blew the fuse the thing that's strange about that is All of the fuses in that fuse box are less than 30 amp. So somehow The 30 amp fuse blew which tells me there's not any one component that shorted out or pulled excessive current uh, I would think because more than likely it would just blow the one fuse in here but instead the main fuse under the hood blew which tells me I might just have too much stuff on that circuit. So I added a 40 amp fuse to it to see how that does and hopefully we don't have any other problems. But let's go for another little ride and uh, see how it goes. So it is the one week countdown to IFO. It's Monday evening. I've been fooling with the car better part of the night. I got home from work and tried to just get a little bit of driving in before the sun went down um, and I had problems. So I'm having a hard time tuning uh, my tip in uh, area of the map. So that's going to be like, you know, relatively uh, high manifold pressure or really like low vacuum, like close to ambient pressure, but really low RPM. So like high load, high, high load, low RPM. I'm just really struggling to get that dialed in. So uh, I got a plan for that. Also, I'm blowing a fuse for my uh, circuit board. So each fuse box has its own fused source voltage. And at least that's how I understood it, uh, or that's kind of how I thought it was, but I failed to recognize that one of the power sources that I'm using tees off and goes to two different things. So I was overloading a circuit. I blew a fuse in it. I thought it was a fluke. So I threw a 40 amp, I went from a 30 to a 40 amp, thinking maybe it, like, the things that were on that circuit in my mind were not anywhere near enough current to blow a fuse. So. I started looking more into what I've done here and when I made this harness and um, one circuit that I thought went straight to a single fuse block that had very little electrical demand um, actually tees off to the one fuse box that I thought it went to plus the relay box that I made. So we were way overloading that circuit. We blew two fuses, I was stranded. Uh, I had to freaking figure out a way to get the car back which was uh, kind of complicated. But uh, I did figure it out and I got it back. So now, so I'm running these dual circuit breakers now. Each one's 50 amps and uh, they just kind of come off and go off towards the fuse boxes. So those are feeding power to a relay that is a 120 amp relay uh, that provides power to like everything that comes on at ignition voltage. So that should sort that out um, and we shouldn't have any more issues there. All right, y'all, Tuesday. Tuesday, the week before IFO, and I came home, got right on the car. I got off work a little bit early because everyone had Halloween plans. Uh, so I got a little head start, uh, filled the car full of E85. And last night, as you guys know, I fixed some things. So today I burned through an entire tank of E85 and here's what I have to report. So on the tuning side of things, um, I have this weird dead spot right at 2000 RPMs on the map and about like 88 KPA or whatever, which is just you know, a little bit of vacuum, but it's mostly uh, a, a, 
it's mostly a low, it's a low vacuum situation, but right at 2000 RPMs, I cannot add enough fuel to the fuel cells there to correct the weird lean spot. I don't know what's happening there. If I have like a spark issue, like maybe the ignition's doing something funny at that RPMs. I really have no clue, but it's pretty easy to work around. Uh, it hasn't really been a huge problem and I don't think it'll be a problem with the track at all because I'll be starting out higher than that, you know, on, on the starting line. Um, but also I'm detecting a lot of knock. I am getting a lot of detonation and I scaled the timing back to basically nothing. I'm still seeing it. Now, mind you, this is a Toyota knock sensor that is wired into my 1985 Corvette knock module. It works to detect knock. It actually is effective. I've seen it. Uh, I've used this setup before on the Lexus, but um, it might be a little too sensitive. I just, I'm not convinced that I'm knocking. You know, I'm running E85. We're seeing 60 degree intake air temp. We're only on like 12 pounds of boost and it's just showing a shitload of knock. So I'm concerned about that. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the plugs out and see how they look. And um, finally, the last thing is I'm, I have an oil leak. I'm leaking oil. Uh, not a lot, but when I park it, when I moved it this morning or after work, there was a couple little spots under it and parked in the driveway and it's got a little spot. So I got to look at that. Looking from here, I can already see uh, there's some oil around the lower oil pan gasket. Now on most cars with this engine, that would be a pretty simple thing to address. But on this car, it is not. That would require probably just dropping the subframe out. Honestly, that'd probably be the easiest way to do that. Uh, I could also raise the engine up, but I can't go up very much because the transmission is so close inside the bell. Honestly, like the engine supported by the body anyway through our motor mounts, so I could drop the whole subframe down without even supporting the engine. That'd probably be what I have to do, but I'll just keep an eye on that. The pan is contacting a couple of places. Um, I believed it to be pretty minor contact, just barely touching it, like barely grazing it, and since the engine's solid mounted, I really did not foresee any problems there, but I will be sure to check those spots and see if they are at fault too. So let's get these plugs out of this thing real quick and take a look at them and see if we see any sign of detonation. All right, y'all. So it's Thursday, okay? I did not make a video yesterday. I spent all night in the garage just screwing with my trigger settings. Something was off. I wasn't really sure what was going on with it, but I checked my base timing and I was 14 degrees off. Now, after I blew up the Lexus engine uh, when I failed to set timing offset correctly you would think i'd be extra careful and i tried to be you know i there's a preset vvti setting in tuner studios that's supposed to be good to go and i was like and the values of the trigger offset are the same that i ran in the lexus tune so i never actually got a timing light on the car i meant to i brought one home from work but i'm coil unplugged so i didn't you got to run like something between the coil and the plug in order to get the trigger for the timing light. So in other words, I kind of decided like, well, it looks like it's probably about right. It wasn't, it was 14 degrees more advanced. That's why I was detonating on my first test drive. I don't even know if I filmed that, but I was getting detonation. It wasn't super severe, but it was showing up. It wasn't severe enough that the Megasquare pulled a bunch of timing, but it was knocking. And I even brought the timing down to like 14 or 13 degrees and it was still detonating. Well, that's because I was actually running like almost 30 degrees uh, whenever I was under load. So anyway, fast forward to yesterday, I'm screwing with my trigger settings in the garage, just driving my neighbors crazy, idling the car for hours. And I ended up changing up my trigger settings. And uh, um, and I honestly, like someone told me this is wrong. I'm running pole level. Now, if you know better than this, then please let me know. But I'm running pole level for my secondary trigger. I don't really know what that means exactly, but the car loved it. Everything synced up. Uh, I'm running a dual toothed wheel now setup, just basically more of a universal setup than I was with the 2JZ file that had me running too much timing. Um, and the car loves it. So I'm on my first test drive with pole level. Somebody told me that's the wrong way to do it, but that's what I did. And damn, this car is running so good, y'all. I just actually made some power rips in it. Now that I know the timing's good, I feel better about it. I checked all the plugs last night to make sure none of them were messed up. I think I did film some of that but um, all the plugs looked okay. They might've gotten a little bit on the hot side, but they were all whole, you know, there was no burnt straps or anything. So um, anyway, I'll screw in with this some more in the garage. Like, man, if I'm not supposed to be on pole, let me try this, this, and nothing was working. So I went back to pole and I'm like, I'm just gonna go drive it. And I'm out driving it right now. And the car is running immaculate. Like it's running so good um, that I finally felt comfortable kind of leaning on it a little bit. And y'all, this thing's a rocket, okay? I've only, the max boost I was seeing on this test drive is 14 PSI. And this thing's a rocket. Listen to this. 
So I'm like, okay, this thing's faster than the Lexus, for sure, on 14 pounds. And then I'm like, I wonder what kind of RPM I saw. The max RPM I saw was 5,400 RPMs. This car is gonna shift at 7,500. We're not even into the juice yet. This is baby stuff. 14 pounds, mid-range RPMs, and she is an absolute shredder. So I'm gonna do some more driving, make sure everything's good, watch my knock, keep an eye on all my parameters, and make sure everything's good and happy. And I don't have a GoPro in the car, so unfortunately you guys are going to miss it. But uh, I'm like ducked out behind some, some business right now, like checking my log and talking to you guys. Uh, I'm gonna get back on the street. We're gonna do a little bit more driving. I got enough gas in the tank to cruise on real, around a little bit more. If I get real comfortable, maybe I'll pull my phone out and film a pull. But I gotta be watching my wideband and I gotta be watching all my all my datas. So uh, everything looks really good right now. It's Thursday. I'm going to the shop tomorrow, Friday, just to check things out. I might touch up the alignment. I might um, double check the pinion angle. Make sure I like where everything's at on the alignment rack. Uh, but yeah, that's where we're at right now. All right, so drives went good. Uh, highest RPMs I saw was 6,200 and everything felt pretty smooth and good there. Checked the data logs and virtually no knock aside from one little tiny spot. Uh, ran pretty conservative timing, so I'm not sure why that is, but it literally was just one second of, uh, or one little spike of indication. So we'll keep an eye on that. I don't plan to change anything. I was only targeting like 15 degrees whenever it happened. But um, anyway, cars on the trailer, Taking it to work tomorrow. Tomorrow is Friday. Uh, I got some stuff here for it. Just we're gonna go over it real good. Uh, do a good nut and bolt check. Um, get the catch can set up, get the dump valve set up. And uh, that'll be the plan for tomorrow. And then just give it a good once over, a good overall inspection. I have a nagging little oil leak that I'm gonna try to contain for the weekend. Just so I don't have to deal with it. I'm gonna have to pull the transmission out to address that. So I'm really hoping it's not up oil pan. Uh, if it's the rear main or the rear cover, that's not a big deal. But fingers crossed it's not the upper oil pan because that is going to be a much bigger job that I just am not ready to stop what I'm doing. Stop having, I'm not ready to stop having fun and take care of that at this time. But I'll check in with you guys tomorrow and let you know how it all looks. Then we got Saturday, which I have all day to do what I need to do. Get tires or whatever, just get everything sorted, get everything gassed up, fluids full, get the truck loaded up with tools and such. Uh, and so if there's anything that I discover tomorrow, I have all day Saturday to get it sorted. Um, but that, uh, that's the plan for this weekend. Hello everyone, today is Friday. We are two days from IFO. I'm at the shop right now. Uh, we closed a little while ago and I stayed after with my girl Goldie here. And uh, just working out some little things. So main purpose of tonight is to nut and bolt check everything, button up a couple little loose ends and uh, possibly check the alignment if there's time, double check pinion angle, go over the car from bumper to bumper I have pretty much touched every fastener on this car in the last year. So more recently, of course, engine trans and everything up here, not that long ago, the rear axle and all that, it really hasn't gotten all that much testing. Uh, I did just during my quick inspections, I got oil leaks. I got oil leaks. I'm really, really annoyed by that because obviously the engine just went together. I used all Toyota seals and it looks like it's leaking from the upper oil pan around where the RTV seals the upper oil pan to the engine block. Uh, I don't want to put oil on the track, so I'm going to work on some means to kind of contain it. Anyway, we're going to take a look at that. Um, but other than that, I'm going to be doing like catch can, water overflow, mount the uh, fire extinguishers in the car, and then just go over the whole thing with a fine tooth comb. Try to set eyes on every single fastener. Try to freaking check clearance between every wiring harness and every freaking part and make sure we got good terminal connections and just try to just do anything I can to avoid any drama at the track. And that's the plan for tonight. In addition to the oil leaks, I found uh, that one of the rack bolts is contacting the lower oil pan. And I actually knew this right after we did the engine, I saw that they were touching, but they're a little bit more intimate than I realized. So first thing I did is I raised the engine up slightly and dropped the cradle down slightly and um, kind of halved the head of that bolt. So now it's much shorter and we have ample clearance. They're not touching at all, but there was a nice little dent in the lower oil pan, like, you know, a small little dent. But um, I think over time, the vibrations would have rubbed, potentially rubbed through the pan and caused an oil leak that would have been very inconvenient to fix. So got that sorted. And that was, so that one's off the list already.
All right, y'all, so I got everything buttoned up on the Z. Just to show you what I did real quick for the things that are visual. Uh, we got the overflow plumbed up over there in the corner. So we can kind of monitor that. If we have any kind of blow by or, or uh, lift the head or have any kind of head gasket type drama, that thing should catch a majority of what comes out instead of it going onto the track. And we can keep an eye on that to know the kind of the general state of health of the engine between passes. So that is something we'll be checking routinely throughout the day. Um, catch can. This is just that same old junky catch can from the Z. I just got it kind of stuck back here. It's just kind of wedged. It's not secured in any way. I don't know. I really, I'm gonna end up going and using both of these ports. That's the reason I have them there. I wanna make sure I evacuate any crankcase pressure once we start kind of leaning on this thing. Right now we're running baby boost and I just don't have enough fittings. I would have just done it. I, ha I brought a bung to weld to this. I would have just done it, but honestly, this thing's too small. I know it's full of crud and it's just not going to be permanent so i just kind of set it there we have one breather going to it a dash 10 hose that should be robust enough to keep us ventilated um and then i went through did a full nut and bolt check checked all the fluids and uh let's see i had that little silicone hose going down to the uh to the wastegate and i wrapped it and some heat resistant tape as it goes between the dump valve and stuff so i wanted to keep it from melting i mean it is silicone but i didn't want it to get too beat up from heat and uh, just kind of a list of miscellaneous little things. Um, and everything's pretty good. Oh, big thing that I did was, and I won't show you because it's under the car, but I, t I made a T under the car for the dump valve. So I did a little experiment here to see how much the dump valve really does. So I took a couple of data logs and uh, this is what we got. So this is a data log from no dump valve. You can see really the number we care about the most here is RPM. And uh, I mean, boost is pretty important too. So you can see it comes up pretty quick and the converter starts to kind of take hold around 2,500 RPMs. And then you see the RPM, this white line stops climbing quite as quickly. So this is like hitting the throttle. And then right here, you're really pushing up against the converter. And so that slows the increase of engine RPM. And so you can see it keeps going up. So like this converter is really nice. I'm really happy with this converter from ATF Speed. Um, this is a lot better than our PTC experience. Mind you, PTC kind of just put a Frankenstein together because I asked them to. Didn't claim to be any kind of experts in the 2J, in the 2J applications. So kind of got what we got. But uh, you can see it kind of slowed its uh, increase here to about 3,300 RPM and almost five pounds of boost. Now the car would leave okay there, but it's not going to leave super hard. So just because the RPM, but that's about kind of where I decided to call it. It would have kept going, but I'm just putting a ton of heat in the converter at that point. So let's look at the time here. We'll go from the time that I'm 100%. So 100% TPS right there. We're at 4.89 seconds. 4.89 and 10 and a half. So what's, I mean, what's that, like six seconds. So about six seconds it took to get to those numbers. Now you have like seven seconds from the time your opponent lights all four of the yellow bulbs or both rows of yellow bulbs. You've got about seven seconds or exactly seven seconds to stage in, to, to bump in before you get red lit. So after about six seconds, we were making about five pounds of boost, 3,300 RPM. All right, remember those numbers. Here we go. Let's open up the other one. All right, so you got to kind of take this with a grain of salt here because the transmission was a lot, a, a little bit warmer because I pretty much did these back to back. So um, basically what we're going to see here, we're going to go to our 100% throttle, which you can see I got on the throttle much more rapidly on this one. Uh, what's that, 16? 16 and a half seconds. And after five seconds, we are already at 3,800 RPMs and almost eight pounds of boost. So the dump valve is paying big dividends here. One full second less, 500 more horsepower, or 500 more RPM. And I mean, what was the other one even at? Was it even at five? Like three pounds of boost, just from, just from using the dump valve. That's the only change. And honestly, the dump valve would have closed at 4,000. So it wouldn't have even, it probably would, you would have seen the RPMs go up and then kind of get pulled back down as the converter filled back up. So dump valve is going to pay off. And the beauty of this is, um, I had like when you're when you're running a small engine with a decent sized turbo, which I wouldn't call this a big turbo, it's just a 67, and it's actually kind of a small 67. But when you're running small engine and single turbo, you heavily depend on 
two-step to get things going, but two-step doesn't really help you in the low RPM band. When you're using two-step, what you're doing is you're letting combustion go out of the uh, combustion chamber and past the turbo. You're basically accelerating the, the turbo wheel by letting combustion happen in your exhaust system, in the headers. So at low RPMs, you just don't really have the gases there. You don't really have the speed and the airflow to get the turbo spinning. I mean, you could do 100% of your combustion in the exhaust and it's, you're not gonna, it's not gonna pay off. You need a lot more flow. So higher RPMs are gonna yield much better outcome from two steps. So basically what this means is, I think looking at it with the dump valve on, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to leave with as much boost as we want to at this point, because it's, it's an exponential thing. So as the boost comes up, you get more power in the engine. And as the engine makes more power, it will push into the converter harder and raise your RPM up further. And it just keeps compounding. So you, you got more RPM, more boost, more power, more RPM, more boost, more power. So really the sky's the limit until you end up frying your torque converter because you, they can only take so much. Um, so I'm really excited about the dump valve results. Went over the whole car, nut and bolt, just inspected every single thing that I have control over as far as fasteners and the installation of things. Uh, and the car's in good shape. That oil leak is driving me nuts. We have to get through this weekend and then I'm fixing it because I just can't stand it. And I, I really think it's just a poor choice of RTV, um, of RTV, RTV type, honestly, because it seems like all the leakage is coming from around the upper oil pan gasket. It's mostly in the rear, but you can also see it elsewhere too. Like this RTV just didn't seal, which is super frustrating. But that's for another day. Just the whole time I was sitting here running the engine, I only got a couple of drops on the ground. So I'm feeling good about that. I got the car vacuumed out. Oh, I also got the fire extinguishers installed. So those are there temporarily. Just I'll put a seat back in the car eventually, but for the event, I'll have those there. And uh, tomorrow, Saturday, putting new front tires on the car because these front tires are just a little old and tired and starting to dry rot. So we get those done and man, that's pretty much it. I went through and put little zip ties on all of my vacuum hoses. I've never really had a problem with vacuum hoses just popping off, but it's free and it's insurance. I mean, the last thing you want is to be chasing some finicky little weird running problem at the track because one of your vacuum hoses popped off and it took you a while to find out, you know, that it happened. So just a little bit of prevention there. Just stick zip ties on all the vacuum hoses. It's a common uh, race car trick. And uh, man, I'm just stoked. I'm stoked. This car is ready to rip. I can't freaking wait. And this thing is ripping on wastegate. And maybe I turn the boost up a tiny bit. A tiny bit. Next time I see you guys, we're going to be at IFO. Oh, wait, wait, wait.